resurrection this morning. So let's stand together as we sing, He Lives and Because He Lives. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today.
cross made the difference for me. Oswald Chambers said that all of heaven is greatly excited by the cross. All of hell is terrified by the cross. Mankind is the only ones who basically ignore its meaning. I submit to you today that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus took the punishment and the payment for all of your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. And because of what he did on the cross, we have the chance and the opportunity to come to faith in Jesus Christ and to be forgiven of our sins and spend an eternity in the wonderful kingdom of heaven. Amen. The cross made the difference. Jesus' body was placed in that tomb. Three days later, they go there expecting to find a dead corpse, taking aloes and all sorts of fragrances and spices to anoint a dead body. But surprise, surprise, there was none. And then the angel said seven words in our English language that really shocked the world. He is not here. He has risen. Amen. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. We come today to celebrate this wonderful occasion of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. It's not Easter bunnies and Cadbury eggs. It's the resurrection of our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for making a way through the shed blood of your son Jesus on the cross that we could be gloriously saved. Lord, we're gonna see it today in the life of a thief that was hanging on the cross. And Lord, we're gonna culminate with the resurrection of Christ. And we're gonna Celebrate, Lord. I'm praying as we celebrate that the hearts of people who are here would be encouraged if they're saved to keep pressing on. But Lord, I'm praying for those who are here that know they're not saved or maybe they have no idea, but by the end of this service, maybe your Holy Spirit would reveal it to them that they would repent and place their faith in you. Lord, I'm asking today, that your Holy Spirit will move amongst all of the people who are here. Lord Jesus, thank you for your death on the cross that we could be saved. The cross made the difference and then you walked out of the grave. Lord Jesus, may your blessing be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you are a visitor here this morning, I want to welcome you to our family. We have a wonderful church family here at Union Baptist Church. I've only been here a couple of weeks, but I've been here long enough to know that this is one of the best churches I have ever been a part of. Amen. Isn't God good? The singing is phenomenal. The instrumentalists obviously are phenomenal. The preaching ain't much, but the... <laughs> no. Hey, welcome to our church. If you are a visitor here, there's visitor cards in the pulpit, uh, excuse me, in the pew in front of you, some of them. Then there's some out there in the foyer. I want you to fill that out. I want to send you a text, call you, have prayer with you, just try to encourage you and thank you for your visit. Um, I hope that you will fill that out and grab a gift as you leave. Also, I want to say a little bit about the Faith Foundations class. You know, uh, we've had a lot of people get saved here lately, amen? amen. And this class, yeah, y'all can applaud that, amen. <laughs> this class that I will be teaching, meeting in here, you know, some people might say it's a new members, new Christians class, but I'm gonna be honest with you, a lot of you old Christians, old members need to be in it too. <laughs> And so we're going to study some doctrines of the faith that are very important. How many of you know how we got the Bible? How many of you would like to know how we got the Bible and evidences that we can trust it? Well, that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. What is the Bible and why can I trust it? We're going to talk about what is faith and how did I get it? We'll talk about what is spiritual warfare and why am I in it? 
What is church? Why should I be a part of it? That is some of the things that we're going to talk about, and I hope that you'll come. Also, we got a crawfish boil next Saturday. <laughs> yep. So for you young adults, you know, you got children at home uh, from kindergarten all the way up to teenagers. You're invited. For, this is a young adult ministry we're trying to get up and off the ground. So if you m- want to come, we want to invite you to be here at 2 o'clock. Come to the 5K, then the Crawfish Bowl. We'll have a wonderful time next week. But most of all, we're here today to worship a risen Lord. So Brother Anthony, since Jesus is here, come and lead us.
our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all.
stand with me as we sing.
Yes, worthy is the Lamb. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who came to take away our sins, was the only perfect sacrifice, the only offering that would do, a flesh and blood offering. For without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness. and government officials, abandoned by friends and followers. The sight of it was hideous. The sun refused to shine. Even God, his heavenly Father, hid his face. by the Roman government. A guard was posted around the clock to make sure no one tried to steal his body. But in the wee hours on the third day, there was an earthquake, a violent earthquake that shook the ground and caused the guards to faint. An angel from heaven rolled back the stone from the tomb and sat upon it. Women who had come to mourn at the tomb were frightened. But the angel said, Don't be afraid. I know that you wonder where Jesus is. Well, he is not here, the angel said. He is not here.
We are living in a broken world. It is very evident that we are living in a broken world. And God did the one thing that could make this broken world be saved. And that is the death of Jesus on the cross. The only thing that could save mankind from their sins was Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross of Calvary. The cross made the difference. I want you to stand with me as we read Luke 22, excuse me, Luke 23, verses 33 and following. I want to read for you part of one of the most glorious evidences of our world being broken. And it is the account of Jesus hanging on the cross and his conversation with a thief. And Luke 23, verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him and saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if this be the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourselves. Now there was also an inscription above him. And one of the criminals who hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, notice he called him by his name. The name Jesus means the salvation of Yahweh. He's professing him as the Savior. He says, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And he said unto him, Truly I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, it is because in your sovereign plan, you had designed that great men of the Bible moved under the unction of the Holy Spirit great men of the faith under the unction of the Holy Spirit would record the words that you had inspired them to write. And Lord, because of that, we have the account of what it was like on the day that you died on the cross. Lord, I humbly come to you asking that you would help us to understand the magnitude of this moment. Lord, I'm asking that you would help me, a weak, frail, sinful individual who is marred by the effects of sinful nature, to be able to preach with power, conviction, love, zeal, and authority, and the Holy Spirit 
the Word of God. Lord, let me preach it in such a way that those who are here, who are lost, will be convicted of sin under your Holy Spirit's probing eye. Lord, help me to preach it in such a way that they would come to faith and know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, help me to preach it in such a way that those who are saved would be encouraged to live in faithfulness to you while we're here in this earth. Lord, may I preach it in such a way that those who are downtrodden and overcome will be inspired to know that there is hope in the cross of Christ. And Lord, I'm praying today that you would help me to preach Christ and him crucified. And Lord, may you bless it. Put your meditations in my mind and heart, your words in my mouth, and let me proclaim with power of the Holy Spirit your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. June 18th, 1815. June 18th, 1815. Some of y'all might have been around then. <laughs> the Duke of Wellington was battling Napoleon Bonaparte. And they were fighting in the English Channel. The English Channel was often given to thick, dense masses of fog, curtains of fog that would move in very quickly. This was an important battle. This was the deciding moment of whether Napoleon was going to conquer the known world or not. And all of a sudden the battle was over and they were communicating back to land with flashing lights and flags. And the fog all of a sudden started rolling in when the message was sent out by a type of Morse code that said, Wellington defeated, and all of a sudden the fog moved in and nothing else communicated. <coughs> the message quickly spread all over Europe that Wellington had been defeated. And it was a sad and somber moment thinking that Napoleon now was going to just take over everything. When all of a sudden, a little while later, the fog lifted and the message was repeated, Wellington defeated Napoleon. And what was thought to be the most somber moment in their world history at that time actually turned out to be the greatest moment in their history. Ladies and gentlemen, similar was the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross. All of Satan's hosts thought they had won. All of the world was clamoring, crucify him, crucify him, and now there he is dead on the cross. And there's all of the disciples and those who love Christ, they're weeping because now the Savior who they had placed their faith in is dead and hanging on the cross. And what they thought was the worst moment in all of their life turned out to be the greatest moment in all of human history. Amen. Where Jesus Christ granted the victory through his sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. The cross made the difference. I don't know if you are aware of it, but we are living in a broken world. You don't have to look very far. You can check out the news headlines. You can turn on to CNN, the constantly negative news network and realize that we're living in a broken world. It doesn't matter what news outlet it is. You can check out either one of them and you can get very depressed very quickly because of all of the brokenness we see. You can see nation rising against nation. You can see unjustness abounding. You can see uh, countries trying to conquer others you can realize that there are even groups of people living in this world who try to traffic other human beings to sell them into slavery and other grotesque things. 
You don't have to look very far to find that we are living in a broken world. Even just this morning, before service began, a young man walked up to me and I was introduced to him and I learned that his dad not too long ago had passed. And now he's living with some family members because his dad is gone. We live in a broken world. Some of you know that pain. My own sister in January 10th of 2014 dies of a drug overdose and we help raise my niece and nephew. We're living in a broken world. How many of you are convinced we're living in a broken world? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you this because everything about that day that Jesus died on the cross says we are living in a broken world. You have the king of glory, the prince of all heaven and earth, who has come down to show us what God wants from us. And now here he is hanging on the cross. He came down to mankind and mankind killed him under the sovereign plan of God the Father. It's broken to take the king of glory, the one who created the heavens and the earth and nail him to a cross. That is wicked and broken. It is wicked for people who once were shouting just a few days ago, hail him, hail him. The king of the Jews are now clamoring to nail him to the cross. That is broken. I don't think they're that much different than us. I realize if that were to happen today, when they were clamoring for him to be nailed to the cross, people would have had their cell phones out videoing so they can put it on social media. <laughs> because we live in a broken world and people want to see that kind of thing. Perhaps that might have been part of the reason they wanted to see it. And then all of the religious leaders, he came into his own and his own received him not. The ones who should have recognized who he was were the very ones plotting his demise. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a broken world. And then all of the people walking by the king of glory as he's hanging on the cross, hurling insults. And in all of the gospels it says, they wagged their heads at him. Hurling insults at the very one who was trying to save their souls. It was a broken scene. Everything about the day that Jesus was crucified says broken world. Then you imagine the two thieves who were hanging on the cross. They were suffering the same fate as Jesus. They were about to die as he was. And yet, even the book of Mark and the book of Matthew tell us even the thieves were hurling insults at Jesus. As a matter of fact, I want to put it up on the screen. Matthew chapter 27, verse 44. And you can flip to it in your Bibles. I want you to see the brokenness of the scene. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Both of the thieves hanging on either side of Jesus were doing what all of the people on the ground and the religious leaders were doing, hurling insults on the king of glory. I want to see the book of Mark, chapter 15. 
Look at what Mark 15 says. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him, with him were also what? Brother Jeff. Yeah. Even the thieves who were hanging on the cross beside him were insulting the King of glory. Wait a minute. We just read Luke chapter 23. It says, one of them says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Can I tell you something, Brother Chad? Something happened to that man along the way. A miracle happened while he was hanging on the cross. A thief who had been hurling insults at Jesus, now all of a sudden is broken and repentant and asking Jesus to forgive him. Wow. Everything about the cross, though, screams brokenness. I want to just kind of paint the scene for you for just a moment. Can you imagine our Lord hanging there on the cross? Do you know what's happened to him? He was arrested in the middle of the night, betrayed by a friend. He had been sweating drops of blood in the garden just prior to this. He's very sensitive to any type of touch because of the thing he was suffering with the trauma in the garden and sweating the drops of blood. And then he gets arrested, gets slapped by one of the guards there in the high priest's home. He's flogged and beaten. They've taken him and they've flogged him. You know what flogging is? How many of you know what it is to be scourged? Some people say that there was 39 stripes that Jesus received and there's 39 diseases known to man and by his stripes we are healed. Can I give you an old ancient Hebrew expression? Baloney. There's not 39 diseases known to man. It seems like every day we got a new one. And there was 39 stripes that, Jesus, that uh, Jews gave in flogging, but he wasn't flogged by Jews, he was flogged by Romans. And it was innumerable. Until the head lictor got tired of beating. They would take Jesus and they would tie him to a four foot stake, about that tall. And they would tie his hands and he would hang just off of the ground. His knees would barely touch and he's hanging like this with his back exposed. And they would take that whip that had the metal beads or rocks in it that would bruise the back and they would begin lashing the back of the criminal. And then after several lashes, they would turn the wrist, the handle of the whip, and it had sheep bone and glass in it and the throngs and it would dig into the flesh and rip it away. And Jesus was beaten unmercifully. If you've seen the passion of the Christ, that's about the closest representation. And then they put a robe on him that would make the thing clot. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they make him carry his own cross to the hill of Golgotha. 125 pound patibulum, cross piece. He's so weak from all of the beating that he suffered that he can't hardly carry it. So they get a North African pilgrim named Simon to carry it for him. You carry his cross. They get Jesus up to the hill of Golgotha. They fling the Lord of glory down in the grime and the grit of the hillside. And they take nails and put it right through the hands. In Bible days, the hand was the first 18 inches from the tips of the fingers to the arm. And so right in here is not conducive for holding weight. Right in here in the wrist is and they nailed him to the cross and then they would hoist him up on that cross piece of the patibulum and swing him over the stipes and then let him down and bend his feet at roughly a 45 degree angle and drive the nails to the second metatarsal area of the, of the ankles. And there they would hang. When you hang like this for a while, you begin to suffocate. All of these muscles in the chest get paralyzed 
And then as paralysis happens, the diaphragm is paralyzed and you can't breathe. And the only way for them to take a breath is to push on the nails in their feet and pull up on the nails in their wrists to relax the muscles so that they could breathe. That's why when you see Jesus hanging on the cross in the movie, he's flailing because he's trying to breathe and not suffocate. The Bible says that they came by to break the legs of the thieves, but Jesus had already passed. He had given up the ghost. Everything about this screams broken. But ladies and gentlemen, something happened just prior to Jesus' death on the cross that was absolutely amazing. In all of this brokenness I've described of the suffering of our Lord, the ridicule and the insults, all of a sudden, one of them has a change of heart. The crowd had been clamoring. The religious priests had been clamoring. Even both thieves hanging on the cross had been shouting insults. But Jesus makes one statement. And I don't know how that one statement, Brother Jeffrey, changed that thief's life and heart. But he makes one statement. The first of the seven statements of Jesus on the cross were, Father, forgive them for they... And I don't know what happened with that statement leading up to it or just after it. But I do know this. That all of a sudden, the second statement of Christ on the cross was, Today, you shall be with me in paradise. Something happened to that thief. I want to give you a couple of words I think help tell the story of Jesus' death on the cross and the thief and ultimately culminating in the resurrection. First of all, I want you to think about the word remorse. Remorse. Because Jesus was hanging there. Both of the thieves were ridiculing him. Then all of a sudden, Jesus says, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I don't know what happened in this man's life, but something around that time impacted him in such a way that he began to feel remorse for what he had done and who he was. It's evidenced in the scriptures. When he says to his friend, don't you fear God? You and I are getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing. Where he was shouting insults, now all of a sudden, he's confessing his guilt. We're getting what we deserve. Something had turned the light on for that man. And now he realizes he's getting what he deserved. Brother Harvey, I've often thought about this man. I don't know what led up to him dying on the cross that day. I've thought about his childhood. Was his mom and dad people of faith? You know that happens sometimes, that moms and dads do all that they can do to raise their children in a godly home, but yet for some reason, A child sometimes never catches on. You know, you had two children raised in Adam and Eve's home, but both of them turned out differently. One honored God, the other one killed his brother. This tells me you can raise them in the same household, but one of them can turn out different. I wonder if that thief on the cross was raised in a godly home and he just never caught on. Now, young people, I want to speak to you for just a moment. If you have a godly mom and a godly dad, I hope that their faith inspires you to live in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you get to glory, you're not going to be able to look at the Lord and say, well, you know, it was somebody else's fault. Well, you know, this happened to me when I was a kid and that just turned me away from you, Jesus. Can I tell you something? Jesus ain't going to accept that. 
well, so-and-so did this to me, and I just had a hard time, and I don't know why you allowed that to happen, but that's what caused me to live the life that I did. Bonk, wrong answer, thanks for playing. When you stand before Jesus, no excuse is going to be adequate. I thought about maybe his mom and dad didn't live a life filled of faith. And whatever decisions he made because of their raising of him led him to whatever happened, something happened that landed him on a cross. Up to this point, his life has been a history of poor decisions. And now here he is paying the piper. And he's so wicked in his own heart that he hurls insults on Jesus just like everybody else. But then he feels remorse. Of all of the people who were there, the one who had the change of heart was one of the thieves that were hurling insults on Jesus. And he says, don't you fear God. You know what had happened to him? Jesus and all of his holiness and righteousness somehow had an effect on this man that he became deeply and profoundly aware of his sin. And he confessed it. We are getting what we deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just speak honest to you? This is one of the things that I don't see in people much these days is an open, honest coming to grips with the depth of their depravity and sinfulness. When the Lord turns on the light in someone's heart, one of the things that naturally happens is an overwhelming sense of the judgment of God on their sinful condition. And that's why the thief said, what he said. Think about this. He's hanging there on the cross because he has broken the law. Mankind kind of models the Lord in the giving of a law. If there was no God who was the moral authority of the universe, we wouldn't even know what laws to make up or enact. And the very fact that we have laws ought to point that there's a divine law in heaven somewhere. But that thief was hanging there, now no longer fearing death on the cross and the judgment for what he had done, but now he's fearing the judgment of Almighty God when he stands before him in conviction. His fear of standing before God was greater than his death on the cross now. And he says it with this statement, don't you fear God. We're getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe and I submit to you that the first step in you coming to true biblical faith in Christ is remorse over your sinful condition. And then I want you to see the word repentance. Think about that thief that was hanging on the cross on the other side, the one who was still hurling insults. He's nailed to the cross. His buddy's nailed to the cross. Jesus is nailed to the cross. Everybody's hurling insults. Even his buddy on the other side of Jesus, they're both insulting Jesus. Now all of a sudden, The thief who persisted in his unrighteousness hurls more insults on Jesus after the Father forgive them for they know not what they do. And now his buddy on the other side has a change of heart. And it was evidenced in his actions. When he said, don't you fear God? Think about that offending thief still hanging there. You just have to imagine that he's been hearing his buddy hurl insults on Jesus 
Now he's being rebuked by that thief. And the thief that got saved is rebuking this guy for the thing he had just been doing himself. It's almost like the other thief who's still persisting in his unrighteousness would say, what in the world happened to you? (laughs) Five minutes ago, you were saying the same thing. Can I tell you, he had repented of his sins. And everybody around it could witness it and see it. Hey, What I'm trying to tell you is when Jesus comes into your heart and touches your life, people are going to see a change in you too. Wait a second, are y'all asleep yet? When Jesus comes into your heart, people are going to see a change in you also. If your walk isn't different and your talk isn't different, something is wrong and you might need to go back and check it out. Think about the thief that was hanging there that had repented. What he had once been doing a few moments ago, now all of a sudden repulses him to hear his buddy keep on doing it. Did you see that? What he had been doing a few moments ago, Mark, now it turns his stomach. Can I tell you something? Sometimes there's some Christians who aren't turned in their stomach enough at the sinful condition of the world and themselves. They'd rather participate in it than separate from it. Ladies and gentlemen, this would explain the reason that we can no longer tolerate the things we ourselves used to do. What we used to participate in now shocks us and appalls us, does it not? And if it doesn't, you might need to get saved. He had repented and he confessed his faith. Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I told you a few moments ago, the name Jesus means the salvation of Yahweh. And now here this thief is calling him by his first name, insulting him one minute, then all of a sudden calling him the salvation of Yahweh the next. He even recognizes him as the Messiah. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And because he said that, Jesus rewarded him. That's the third word, reward. Jesus said, I tell you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Can you imagine the shock? Everything in this man's life had led up to this moment of him dying on the cross. And now all of a sudden he's rewarded because of his faith and repentance. And he's given acceptance into heaven. I like what Alistair Begg Great preacher. How many of you have ever heard of Alistair Begg? I like what Alistair Begg said about this. I got a little video. If you will, Brother Anthony, roll that beautiful bean footage. Without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old... uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. Think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense, I I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you 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 were cussing the guy out with your friend, 
You'd never been in a Bible study. You'd never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, you know, we, uh, uh, did you? <laughs> Excuse me, let me get my supervisor. They go get the supervisor ranger. So, we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you are you are you are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> the guy said, "I've never heard of it in my life." And and what about? Uh, let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually, in frustration, he says, "On on what basis are you here?" And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. Now, now, that's the, that is the only answer. That is the only answer. And if I don't preach the gospel to myself all day and every day, then I will find myself beginning to trust myself, trust my experience, which is part of my fallenness as a man. If I take my eyes off the cross, I can then give only lip service to its efficacy, while at the same time living as if my salvation depends upon me. And as soon as you go there, it will lead you either to abject despair or a horrible kind of arrogance. And it is only the cross of Christ that deals both with the dreadful depths of despair and the pretentious arrogance of the pride of man that says, you know, I can figure this out and I'm doing wonderfully well. No, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's why Luther says most of your Christian life is outside of you in this sense. That we know that we're not saved by good works. We're not saved as a result of our professions. But we're saved as a result of what Christ has achieved. Amen. The cross made the difference. It gave the broken world of a thief hope of salvation. And it guaranteed that as we live in this broken world, we can have hope of salvation as well. Amen. The cross made the difference. But can I tell you something glorious? He didn't stay on the cross. They took him to a tomb and placed his body there. And then they rolled a stone in front of it. Three days later, they came expecting to find a dead body and found an open tomb and guards laying on the ground. And an angel sitting there, kicking his feet, whistling Dixie. <laughs> Daring all of, heaven, of all of earth and hell to try and roll it back into place. It wasn't removed for Jesus to be let out. It was removed to let us in, to see he's alive. Ladies and gentlemen, I have given you three words that kind of tell the story of the thief on the cross that day. And I've given you three words that I hope you realize could be your story as well. Because the thief of the cross is our story. If you don't see yourself in the thief hanging on the cross, then you've missed the point of the story. Now, ladies and gentlemen, remorse, repentance, and reward. Because the cross made the difference. Will you please stand with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I pray that it has gone out and impacted the lives of people. May they be saved as a result of the preaching. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
If you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to pray this way with me. With every head bowed, every eye closed, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I invite you into my heart. You died on the cross for me, and you rose again. Save my soul, Lord Jesus. And I ask that you would just write my name in your book of life. Thank you for loving me so much. Save me, Jesus. I place my faith in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray to ask Jesus to save you, please come and take me by the hand. And I'll know you've gotten saved. And I can help you in your walk with Christ. Maybe you want to join membership of Union Baptist. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Come to the altar and pray. You do what the Lord's leading you. Jesus, we ask you for your glory. Amen. made the difference. I hope it made the difference for you. Made the difference for Drake. <laughs> Drake came forward this morning saying, I have asked Jesus into my heart, but I've never been baptized. So Drake Roberts wants to come and be baptized. He got saved in vacation Bible school last year, and he wants to be baptized in believer's baptism. He's 11 years old. May I have a motion from the church? Amen. Y'all give him a round of applause. Very good. Yep.